Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you uh, decided to come out and worship with us this Sunday morning. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm the chair of worship here at Moans Hill, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you on this beautiful, sunny uh, Sunday morning. Much better weather than we were having last month with all the rain all the time. I was getting quite sick of a thunderstorm with an inch or two every single day. But this month is looking a lot, lot nicer, and I love it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started here uh, for our morning worship. A couple of announcements before we uh, jump right into it. Uh, first off, uh, our Celebrate Recovery Ministry uh, is in need of a practice audience, and that's uh, tomorrow night, uh, 6.30 to 8. Uh, they just want to go over everything uh, and make sure that it all is cohesive and sounds great, and uh, it's the first time Moans Hill is doing a ministry of this type, and we want to make sure that we get it right. Uh, so if you are available to come and participate as a practice audience, uh, that is tomorrow night uh, starting at 6.30, and if you have any questions on it, you can see Derek right there. I'm going to laser pointer him. There he is, right there. So uh, I knew this laser pointer would come in handy at some point or another. So uh, any questions, go ahead and see Derek. Uh, next up, uh, if you help out with our children or youth ministries in any capacity whatsoever, if you teach Sunday school, if you help out with our youth group, if you uh, watch kids in the nursery, doesn't matter, uh, there is a mandatory meeting uh, this Wednesday, August 21st at 6 p.m. Um, so uh, that's just to go over child safety stuff uh, and things that are mandatory for, it, the, it's the law, uh, that we have to know if we're taking care of kiddos. So if you help out with that at all, uh, please be at that uh, meeting, and April is the one, there you go, with the green laser pointer for April, she's the one to, to ask questions about that one. And lastly, uh, Celebration Sunday is coming up, and you all know what that means free breakfast. That's right. So uh, be sure to come out for Celebration Sunday. That is September 8th, 9 a.m., and uh, we get to hear about all the great ministries, uh, that are, all the great things that are happening at Moans Hill, and how God is being glorified, uh, and how he is using us to glorify himself, and it's a wonderful thing. So uh, those are the announcements for the morning. Uh, anything else, go ahead and check out your bulletins. You should have gotten a bulletin on your way in. Uh, there's a lot of great info in there as well. At this time, we're going to go ahead and get started with our uh, music worship, so would you stand with us as we sing? Glory divine, 
gates of heaven have beckoned me in. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? What can be said? What can be sung as a On my way into work uh, during the car ride, I listen to podcasts. Who likes to listen to podcasts in the car? You guys, right over there. Okay. One of the podcasts I listen to is by Ravi Zacharias. How many of you have heard that name before? I love that guy, right? And um, he has a podcast where it's just recordings of question and answer series that he does at different universities all over the country. And he would, uh, some of these uh, Q&As, you know, these people ask questions uh, from the viewpoint of, I'm a Christian and I need help with this question when my non-Christian friends ask me this question. And some of them are questions of, I'm not a Christian, so help me explain this thing, you know, or help to explain this thing to me that I don't quite understand. And some of them are, I'm not a Christian, so how do you answer for this? And then they ask their question with that kind of an attitude. Well, this one guy stood up and asked a question. He goes, I'm an atheist. And he goes, but I've been really searching for something. You know, and he, he, he goes on and he was so humble and with such humility, he asked this question and phrased this question of, you know, I've read through some of the scriptures and I have great respect for what you are doing and just coming out and answering questions from people that don't necessarily believe. And he, you know, he just came up and like, help me out. You know, I want to believe. And, you know, he, he kind of asked this question. He goes, without pointing me at scripture, tell me why I should believe what you believe. And if somebody asked me that question, I'd be like, ooh, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> but they, they had an answer too, you know. Their answer was more of this. They said, humans are inbound with this curiosity, the, the asking of the question, why? You know, why are we built this way? Why is life the way it is? Why do we have so many unanswered questions? You know, and we have this innate curiosity that's in our DNA. You know, they said, the li if you're looking from a purely evolutionary standpoint, we shouldn't have that. A lion doesn't ask why he's eating the rabbit. He just does it. Survival of the fittest. And he said, the, the reason we have these questions of why is, and his answer was, it's because God delights in our finding out about it. God hides things from us so that when we find it, he gets a big old smile on his face. You know, it's a lot like a father. When I'm reading a book to my son, and he's kind of picking out words here and there, not quite knowing what it is, but if he sounds out a word and he gets it right, he's so happy that he gets the word right. And me, I am thrilled. I knew the word, but I didn't tell it to him because I wanted him to figure it out on his own, and that makes me so happy. And God puts this innate curiosity in us so that when we figure out the answers to these questions and these questions or these answers lead us to him, it just fills him with joy. 
You know, and that's why we're here this morning. It's so that we can have these questions that we have answered on a weekly basis. It's why Ken goes out and preaches the word to folks from other countries. It's so that their questions can be answered. And when we teach and when we get our questions answered, that delights our Heavenly Father. Amen? Love it. Let's sing our next song. Father God, you are stronger. You are stronger than our doubts. You are stronger than our questions, God. You're stronger than our confusion. You're stronger than our anger when we just don't get it. 
And Father God, we praise you for that. We praise you and thank you that you delight in our learning more about you. Just as a, a, a father delights when his toddler learns, you delight when your children come to know you better. We thank you for that, Father. Today I ask that uh, you would be with us as we uh, listen to Brother Ken, as he comes to speak about his work around the world, God. And I uh, thank you that you've provided for him for his 20, nearly 25 years of ministry, God. And we thank you uh, that you not only provide uh, with a financial sense, but you provide uh, with a health sense and, a, and giving him a drive to do what you call him to do. Father, I want to lift up also this morning, I want to lift up Donna Heck, who is uh, still in the hospital with great pain. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless the doctors as they uh, continue to run their tests and figure out what's going on. And I pray that you would uh, grant wisdom and comfort uh, to those that are involved in that situation, God. We know that you are the great physician and the great healer. And uh, we, we pray that we would lift Donna up to you this morning. But right now, I thank you that we've all come together to learn more about you, and we've all come together to hear what Ken has to say. And I pray that uh, you would bless us this morning. In your name, amen. You may be seated, and I'll have our ushers come forward to take the morning's offering. At this time, we'd like to dismiss our children's children to Children's Church so they can uh, get up and start moving. Uh, there's, no, uh, <laughs> there's no children's sermon. Just go to Children's Church this morning. Sorry, guys. Oh, unless Pastor Ken wants to <laughs> wing it. <laughs> no, I, I think this will be great. You guys get a head start to Children's Church. All right. Yeah, we really are glad to have uh, a visitor with us this morning, and I could probably go on and uh, tell stories of the good old days. With him. No, no, when he was our assistant pastor here at Moans Hill. But let me just uh, read to you a brief uh, introduction that will fill you in on who he is for some of you who really don't know him. Uh, we certainly uh, enjoy supporting him and being an important supporter of him as he is the following. Uh, he is currently a teacher at Zabrosia Bible Seminary where he teaches theology, Bible interpretation, Old Testament Hebrew, and English. In addition, he serves as a preacher elder in a local Ukrainian church where the pastor is one of his former students. Uh, Ken was raised in an Irish Catholic family. 
But after receiving Christ personally in 1977, he became involved with the EC Church in Whiting, New Jersey, where Alan Hipkiss, an Englishman, collaborated with an Irishman. Now, that doesn't happen unless God's Holy Spirit is in the, the middle of that. Uh, so Ken uh, was mentored by him to go into ministry. Ken graduated from uh, Evangelical School of Theology in Myerstown and served as an assistant pastor here at Moans Hill for seven years. After considering missionary work in Ireland, Ken joined European Christian Mission in 1995 as a Bible seminary teacher in the city of Zabrosia. Zabrosia is in central eastern Ukraine, which is a politically unstable area of, uh, as a result of the Russian occupation of eastern Ukraine. So uh, we have to keep him in our prayers, and we're glad to have him come on. Pastor Ken, come up here and share with us. Am I mic'd? Yes? Oh, you can hear. This is the first time in my life I've worn one of these things. Uh, and I, I, I keep feeling like I should be taking off my hat in church. It feels like a hat on my head. And I had that instinct. I said, oh, I should take that off. And then I realized, it's not a hat. It's a microphone. Well, it's so good to be here again after four years since my last furlough and uh, to see many familiar faces and to see some unfamiliar faces. That's, that's uh, a great thing, too. Um, I'm going to start by not saying much. Uh, we're going to go right to a video. So let me, let me set that up for you first. And it runs about 10 minutes. And then I'll come back and say a little bit more after. Now, the first four minutes of this video, those of you who were here four years ago, you've seen it already. Uh, it's a sort of promotional that we put together for our, our seminary. And then the six minutes after that is fresher stuff that I've, I've filmed, recorded just over the last uh, three or four months. Um, while the first four minutes run, because it's only got a musical background, I might even uh, come and, come and commentate on it a little bit. So we'll keep this on. So I'm going to come back and join you, and we'll watch the video, okay? My friend is also the pastor of our church. This teacher heads up our missionary department. So we've had students from all over Ukraine, students from Russia, Lithuania, Armenia. Students from outside the city live in our dormitory. The librarian is a former student of mine. This brother was from Kazakhstan. We've had a number of students from Kazakhstan. He was also from Kazakhstan. He's from the Bronx.
He's the son of our Old Testament te professor. I'm trying to help him right now get into uh, get into a seminary for further study. He would love to be a teacher at our school. He was also from Kazakhstan. That's the Old Testament teacher. arranging get-togethers and fellowship like this. Okay, and now some more recent clips that will speak for themselves. Кстати, Иоанн Креститель на греческом, на английском языке – это Иоанн Баптист. Может быть, кто-то думал, откуда Баптисты взялись. Ну вот, это те, Our church is growing крестит, wonderfully. Тоже, но а мы не крестим земли, а кровью еще. А может быть, разве что будут желающие. Но, но если серьезно, то... We have a great age range also. The young man at the piano just got married last month. He's quite a pianist, by the way. Олег, <laughs> Наркотик. Олег. The young man with the bow tie. I've known him since he was a very little kid. Well, here I am back in Ashtarak, Armenia, on a crisp, brisk February morning, but not frigid. And I'm teaching here at the seminary. Uh, the Armenian Seminary. I'm doing a two-week course on the Epistle to the Galatians. I've been coming here regularly once or twice a year for, oh my goodness, about 18 or 19 years now. And uh, so it's a very happy, familiar place for me to be. Mons Hill has a very curious connection with Armenia, by the way. I'll tell you about later.
Test time is the only time I can keep them quiet. Armenians are very lively. They're singing, Blessed, blessed is that house. Blessed, blessed. Там псалм я сказал, Господь, ты моя сила и песня. И это говорит о важности пения Господи в церкви. Оно пробуждает духовное состояние. The boy in the middle is Vova's son. <laughs> At the Vkosna. I said, is it tasty? <laughs> yeah, really tasty. средства для служения. И еще хотел бы упомянуть наших братьев, отцов церкви, которые стали истины, которые с того времени пришли сюда, и они уже многие года служат областными пасторами, пасторами церкви нашему области, нашей стране. Well, that's it. So you just took a little trip to Ukraine and Armenia, so I hope it gives you a little bit of a flavor of uh, what my life is about over there. <coughs> I mentioned Mons Hill's connection to Armenia. Maybe some of the old timers remember we used to have a custom here for Father's Day every year. Uh, some couple in the church would be assigned the task of finding a special speaker for that day. And they'd go off and find a speaker. <clears throat> and uh, one year, uh, John and Marie Stutz had the task. And Marie uh, used to uh, work at a crisis pregnancy center with a fellow named Jeff Campbell. And she asked Jeff to come to Moans Hill and speak. And he was kind of, oh, I don't know, and, and, and Jeff's uh, wife, Maria, said, oh, you have to do it. The long and the short of it is he came and he preached here, of course, not here, but over there, and um, <clears throat> after the service, Marie introduced me to John and said, this is our assistant pastor, Ken, we're losing him, he's going over to Russia soon, and Jeff said, Russia? Where in Russia? And I said, well, not really Russia, I'm going to Ukraine. And he said, Ukraine? Where in Ukraine? And I said, oh, well, it's a, it's a place you've never heard of. It's a city called Zaporozhye. He said, Zaporozhye? My church has a sister church in Zaporozhye. And it turned out that his church, Calvary Monument Bible Church in Paradise, was a sister church 
to the church that I was going over to, to, to work with. And um, uh, so I got to know Jeff and, and uh, Calvary Monument, and uh, we became great friends. And fast forward about 20 years, and his, uh, old, uh, his firstborn, Zach, was a grown-up, and he, he loved reading about that part of the world, Armenia and Georgia and Turkey and those countries. He was fascinated by it. And I was telling him on email one time, I'm going back to Armenia to teach. And he's saying, what's it like? What are the people like? What are the food like? And I said, why don't you come on over and find out for yourself? I'll be there. You come on over. Uh, my, one of my great pals there, a, a sort of protege of mine, He'll be there, and uh, I'll be busy teaching, but you guys can go tour around and look around. And uh, next day, I got an email from his parents. Where are you taking our son? <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, don't worry, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. So the long and the short of it was that he came over. He and my Armenian protege, Geram, uh, they went all over Armenia, had a great time. And Zachary saw more of Armenia than I've ever seen. And uh, he really liked Armenia. And as it turned out, he also happened to end up really liking a certain Armenian who was the daughter of the pastor of the church a hundred feet down the road from the seminary. Well, guess what? Now... They're married and they live just down the road from you here in, uh, off, uh, just near Paradise. So if Moans Hill had never had that custom of inviting somebody to come, then I never would have met Jeff and his son would have never asked me about Armenia. And so, so I better tell the newlyweds that, that they have to invite all of you to their 50th wedding anniversary. So, <clears throat> but isn't that amazing how God works in such ways? And, um, God has worked in so many way, may, amazing ways in my life. In, in the video, <clears throat> towards the end, you saw a young man preaching in our chapel service. And his name is Rostislav, or for short, Rostik. He calls me Papa. I met him when he was 15 years old. He grew up in a chaotic, broken family situation. Um, many kids multiple fathers. He himself never met his father. No idea who he is. When, when the mother wasn't capable of feeding the children, she would ship them off periodically to an, an orphanage. So the children would spend part of their childhood living in the orphanage. Then when she was a little bit better uh, to handle then they'd come home and live with her again for a while, and then back to the orphanage. That was his life. And one fine day at the Bible college, as we called it then, we were holding a, a Bible camp, like VBS. I think it was actually with the help of a team from Calvary Monument. And I was out front at a little table at a registration desk, and he has some of his buddies just what happened to walk by. And his buddies were interested right away. Ooh, what's this? A uh, camp. Uh, we, have free, we have food every day. Okay, we're signing up. And, uh, but Rostik stood off at a distance, half hiding behind a tree, kind of looking at us. And I, I went like this. <laughs> and he looked and said, like that. And I said, like this. And he went. And finally, about the third or fourth time, he, he walked over. And uh, he signed up. I don't know whatever happened to those other buddies of him, of his, who eagerly signed up. But Rosti came to the Lord, and he and I became really like father and son. And uh, as you see now, he's a student at the seminary. He's got a wife and two little girls. Uh, isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful what the grace of God orchestrates and arranges that we could never foresee and never plan on? We just have to be available, and God will do it. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from Scripture before I go on. 
from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapters 4 and 5, I might just take a few little parts out of it, not read the whole thing. But Paul says things like this, Therefore we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. One one of the sisters here uh, noticed that I'm whiter than I used to be, and I am, I'm whiter. But my my hearing isn't what it used to be. <clears throat> and I at first I thought I thought she said I was wider <laughs> than I used to be. <laughs> and I am. <laughs> but I'm also whiter too. <clears throat> we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what's unseen. For what's seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what's mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it's God who's made us for this very purpose. Therefore, we're always confident. Can we say that? That's the way we want to live. Therefore, we're always confident. That should describe the inner state of our hearts every day. Not about everything. We can't be confident about the weather, about politics, about health. There's a lot of things we can't be confident, but that's not what Paul's talking about, of course. We can be confident about what matters most. And if we're not, then we need to come back to the source where our confidence rests. Therefore, we are always confident. We live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. There's a paradox in the scriptures because elsewhere, doesn't Jesus say, this is funny, I'm not used to this. I can walk around and you can still hear me. Okay, I still live in the Stone Age, forgive me, but I do. I don't even have a smartphone. Um, There's a paradox in the Bible because... Here it says we walk by faith, not by sight, which gives you the idea that we don't see. But elsewhere, doesn't Jesus say, I am the light of the world, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, so they should not stumble. So which is it? Do we see or don't we? The Bible seems to say both. And of course the answer is both. The Bible wouldn't say it's both if it's not both. We see and we don't see. And the way I rationalize that out to myself, the the picture that quite a long time ago I developed in my mind to help me understand this, is I'm walking life's long path. It's You know, life is long and short, isn't it? We say life goes by so quick. Life goes by very fast, but it really does seem awfully long at times, doesn't it? We're walking a long, long path through life, and it's dark. It's a dark world. We're walking in the darkness. We are. We're walking in the darkness. I'm not contradicting the Bible. But we're walking a long, dark path through this life. But around us, around us, there's there's a light. God casts a circle of light around us so that we can see where to plant the next three or four, maybe five steps, so that we should not stumble, but have the light of life. Beyond that light that he gives us, and he does, so we know where to put the next step. But beyond that circle of light, It's dark. It's real dark. 
And we don't know what lies beyond that circle. We don't know what ditches or ravines or sudden twists and turns or bogs or stones are lying in that road in the darkness along that long, long path. But it's enough that he knows and it's enough that he gives us the light to know where the next four or five steps go. But that's not the whole story. Because way, way down that path, way beyond the darkness that we can't see into, there on the horizon, there's a, a radiance. There's a glow. There's a dawning of the coming parousia, the great appearing, the day of the Lord. And we know we're heading there. So the light that surrounds us and that far distant light that beckons us on, that's the reason, as Paul said, therefore we are confident and we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's, that's the lifestyle that I have very much been living in Ukraine, especially the past year. Maybe that's why these words mean so much to me right now, because we, and I don't just mean me, I mean me and everybody who is a part of my life there in Ukraine, my, my great pal Volva, and the teachers at the Bible school, and the church members in my local church, we're living day by day, not knowing what's beyond that little circle of light ahead of us, or whether the whole thing could blow up the day after tomorrow because of the things that Brother Bob referred to. Geopolitically, uh, it's been about four years since Ukraine threw out. It, it, in fact, it had already happened before my last furlough. So I talked about this a little bit on my last furlough. It was all still very fresh then very fresh and raw. Now we've settled into a status quo. Perhaps a false complacency or a deceiving complacency. Because just two hours drive away from us, there's a war going on with Russian military in Ukraine supporting separatists and just a young man died today, a young, yesterday, a young Ukrainian soldier. Every day we're getting reports about deaths on the front. And people from my church and the other Baptist churches in the city, they're going out there regularly bringing humanitarian aid and the gospel to people living in the war zone at the risk of their lives. One of them was captured by separatists a few years ago. And by any human measure, there was almost no hope of his surviving. But by miraculous interventions, he came back to us. And he goes back there now with his team regularly. I was invited to go out there. <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite young people who used to be an interpreter for the death, death at our school he, uh, he's part of the team that goes out there. He invited me one day to, to go out there with them on one of their visits. And uh, I went back to the seminary, and I walked into Vova's office, and I said, you know, Yura Kalesnik asked me to go out on one of their tours to the, to the front. What do you think? And Volva, who's at times like a brother, at times like a son, and at times like a father to me, uh, I'll never forget it. He just sat there at his desk and he looked at me. Ken, no, <laughs> you're not doing that. It's not going to happen. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. It would be too risky, too foolish, not only for my sake, 
But if I went out there and got captured, it puts a whole lot of other people in a dreadful situation. All of my friends and colleagues who now have to worry how to rescue the American, their dopey American friend who got himself in this fix from, from this terrible situation. So it wouldn't be fair to a lot of people for me to, to do that. So I didn't, I didn't go out there. <clears throat> so we're living with this every day taking the next step in our circle of light as the Lord shows us, doing the thing we believe to be right, whether it's opening new ministries in our church, ministries to the deaf, ministries to families who have children with cerebral palsy, uh, ministries to unchurched youth in affiliation with, maybe you've heard of this American mission called Young Life, and in affiliation with them, we've got a, a very strong Young Life program going on. And, and as you saw, the Lord is blessing this fruit. The church is growing. We've got the classic good problem uh, with no space. Uh, it's a good problem, but it's a problem still. And we're exploring different avenues. And we keep doing it always knowing that maybe the day after tomorrow, it'll all be taken away. The evangelical Baptist churches in the regions that the Russians have taken over, they're being harassed, persecuted, shut down, because this, this political position of Putin and, and, and these people uh, is strictly Russian Orthodox because it's, it's, it's uh, a nationalistic, quasi-religious philosophy that um, is all about Mother Russia and Orthodoxy. So uh, that's happening just a couple of hours away from us. And we know what would happen to us. The seminary would be shut down. Which makes you ask sometimes when you get up in the morning, Lord, is it worth it? I see where the next step and the step after that goes, but what about the ninth and 10th and 11th step? Maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's not worth it. And we, not just I, but we believe that God's answer to us is to keep going. Keep going forward. Do the next thing I've shown you to be right. Don't worry what's beyond that. Because everything we do for Him in the communion of His Spirit, in the fellowship of His love, in the grace of Christ, can never, ever be not worth it no matter what happens. It can never, ever be not worth it. It can't be taken away. Even if the seminary is shut down the day after tomorrow, even if the church is boarded up by the Russians in two months, everything that happened, every act of grace, every move of God's Spirit, every heart that was touched, is eternally, eternally good fruit in the Father's kingdom. So the things that are seen are temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. And that's how we're coping with it right now. That's how I'm coping with it. I'm 61 years old. I'll be 62 in November. <clears throat> and so these questions are relevant to my own life. Am I going to come back here in four or five years for another furlough and travel all over Ohio and Illinois and Pennsylvania and Virginia and New Jersey to talk about my work? Or am I going to retire? I'll be 65, 66 years old by then. You've got to think about these questions. If God even gives me the health and the strength and the life to be here four or five years from now. Right now, on my horizon, that's a big question mark. 
sort of a big blank. I don't know. So I'm taking it step by step, day at a time, trusting the Lord. The seminary, we've had our struggles too. It's a big, long story that I could talk about for the next two hours. You, you didn't have anywhere to go, did you? Uh, no. Uh, but the one minute summary is we're facing opposition. Sadly, tragically, heartbreakingly, our seminary is facing severe, brutal opposition from within the Baptist denomination and from some of the Baptist leadership. Not the national leadership at the headquarters in Kiev. Thankfully, they're completely behind us. But from some of the more local leadership, I can honestly tell you, let me be frank, that the past year of my life in Ukraine has been the worst since I went there in 1995. Now, I don't say that to you with a defeated attitude or meaning to say, I'm traumatized, I don't know if I can go back there, etc., etc. No, it's just been the worst. All of us have the worst year of my life sometime or other, don't we? For different reasons. And probably this has been one of the worst ones. But I say that with a smile. Because as we have suffered and struggled through these things at the seminary, it's brought us all closer together. The questions aren't resolved. I don't know what I'm going back to. But it has cemented our resolve and our determination to take the next step, do the next good thing that he shows you to do, trusting that whatever happens, even if some things fall apart and some things end, well, guess what? After every ending in this life, until Jesus comes, there's a new beginning. Something else always begins. That's what God does. So our stake, our investment, our heart's treasure is not in the mere perpetuation of programs and institutions and projects that we've started, but in investing our lives like seeds in the eternal ground of the kingdom of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And that investment can never be defeated. And it will bring fruit to the Father's joy. For this I have chosen you, to go and bring fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that fruit doesn't always look like what we thought it was going to be. 20 and 30 and 50 steps down the path, God will surprise you and it will be something greater. Well, pardon my rambling, my rambling sermon. A little bit of a report from the field, a little bit of a biblical meditation, all mixed up together. Uh, I hope it meant something to you. I want to thank you for your support, your prayer support, your friendship, your material support, for keeping me, keeping me in borscht and potatoes, not to mention health insurance, oy vey. And uh, that's a painful topic, isn't it? Um, <coughs> Practically half of what I get goes to my health insurance, but I probably don't have to tell you about that. So, uh, thank God my support is staying steady, strong. Four years ago, 
I, I asked for a little raise, and you came through. Thank you. I'm not asking for another. <laughs> Just stick with me, and I appreciate so much. This church is home. It wasn't actually seven years. It was more like five. I don't know, maybe it seemed like seven, but it was more like five that I was here. And some things you can never, ever escape from in life. You're doomed always to be reminded. Somebody commented on my purple hair here this morning. So what could I say? I'm doomed forever to be connected to a little bit like the a little bit the color of, uh, of, of Jesus' sash there in, in, uh, in Brother John's p- uh, painting back there. So, <clears throat> but uh, what can you do? Uh, it was a funny thing. It was a funny thing that happened. And if you don't know about it, now somebody's going to tell you. Um, thank you so much for your attention and your, your partnership in the gospel. And one way or the other, Lord willing... I look forward to being here again and seeing you, uh, whether four years from now or sooner. Who knows? It's in God's hands. Amen. 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 Well, thanks, Brother Ken, for speaking with us. Uh, We're going to go ahead and close with our our final song for the morning. So if you would stand, uh, we'll begin singing.
Heavenly Father, encircle us with holy light. Give us of the good gift of your Holy Spirit to do good, to show mercy, to love peace, and to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, in the fellowship of your Holy Son, our risen Lord Jesus. Bless us as we go, we pray. Strengthen us, unite us, and make us your gift to one another, to the world, and to your Holy Father. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, in your holy name, amen. Go in peace.